Everybody, this is Ricky with Simplify. Can you guys hear me out there? Feel free to type in. Okay, good. All right, so now we're filing in. So, Josh, um, I'll let you take it away whenever you see fit. Hey, this is Josh, the products manager from Wholesale Solar. Uh, we had we had scheduled this training with Simplify originally for our employees, and then we kind of shot it out on the uh, to our installers to see if anyone was interested in in attending. Um, basically, we're really excited about lithium batteries and Simplify's product. Uh, it eliminates a lot of the issues around batteries. Um, so we're really glad you're able to join us today. Um, Wholesale Solar is an off-grid distributor, so basically we can help you. We supply Simplify batteries and we can also help you with uh, inverters, panels, controllers, any other components. Um, with that being said, take it away, Ricky. Um, so we got, a, we got a lot to cover here. Um, we might not have a time, time for a whole bunch of questions, but we'll get some information at the end, uh, how you can reach uh, Wholesale Solar, uh, get your questions answered, uh, should you have any. And uh, special thanks, uh, Josh and, and Wholesale Solar. Um, it's great to be here uh, with a, a company that has a lot of experience uh, from my early days in, in solar and in renewables. I definitely turned to Wholesale Solar and I know a lot, I still to this day use a lot of your tools on your website, like for peak sun hours, which comes out great uh, when, uh, when I'm trying to design battery banks. So um, awesome to be here with you. Uh, my name is Ricky Sklanowski. I am a uh, sales and applications engineer at Simplify. Um, among other things, uh, one of the primary things I do is tell you whether or not our batteries are suitable for certain applications. What I'm hoping you'll see from this training is that it almost always is. So uh, on the agenda, I'm not going to read through each bullet point, but we have kind of like a mid-level overview of Simplify's product line and value proposition and what really differentiates us from some of the other industry leaders out there. Okay, so specifically Simplify, we're, we are the safest, most efficient, and simplest way to use energy storage. So what that means is we have the safest chemistries, unparalleled cycle life, and easy to deploy and install and scale uh, systems. And uh, what you're looking at right there on your right is our access unit and we'll get into that a little bit later. So Simplify optimizes any power generation source for on or off grid. Um, so whether it be grid or PV or a generator, um, on or off grid, uh, we can do it. We can do it. So, um, and one of the things that we do that differentiates us from our competitors um, is that we can DC and AC couple our systems. So Sonin, for example, uh, only has AC coupling systems. So uh, here's, a, here's a map of where we're deployed, over 22 countries as it reads, 27 megawatt hours since 2010. Uh, we actually started in 2002 um, as Ojai Electric Systems, and then in 2010 became Simplify, and uh, we started off in the film and TV industry and then became really popular with, uh, in, in, uh, with the Department of Defense and being used in uh, military applications. So you can see uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, has been uh, highlighted here. Uh, we were known with the Department of Defense really liked us because we could be deployed into some of the harshest environments in the world. So here's our, uh, our customer base. And what you can see is that it cuts a wide path. Uh, we don't really have a, a prototypical customer. There are all kinds of applications, as I said at the outset, for our storage system, and that is kind of evidenced by this customer base. Uh, you can see in the bottom right quadrant uh, some of those military applications I was alluding to. Uh, residential, we have some small install, local installers, and uh, then uh, in the top left quadrant, uh, utilities, LADWP, and then of course we have some emergency response customers as well. And here we have um, our, a graph showing our, our expected market growth, uh, and by our I mean everyone on this, on this call. The energy storage industry is set to experience exponential growth, estimated about $2 billion by 2020. In fact, our revenue tripled last year alone. Note how evenly split it is amongst the light blue, which is uh, uh, residential, 
the darker blue, which is non-residential, and utility, which is the darkest blue there. So that means no matter which space you're primarily involved in, there is an ESS uh, application for you. I'm getting some notes here, so let me just see. So again, I just want to double check everyone can hear me out there. Okay, great. Someone was having problems hearing, and I just didn't know if it was applied to everyone. I want to make sure everyone can hear. All right. So here is probably the most common notion of how storage can be utilized. So you bank your solar production, shown in, in, in light blue here, and you bank that during the day, and then at night when the sun goes down, you can utilize that energy that's been stored in your batteries. And that's what we call priority power. And then, and these, uh, we, there's, uh, uh, storage can also be used uh, for rate-based consumption. So what you're looking at right here is kind of a, a typical rate schedule where uh, during peak hours, uh, shown by the orange there, you're charged a higher rate on your bill. And uh, kind of around those kind of afternoon hours or your mid-peak, so that's like the medium part of your bill. And then in the early morning and late night hours, you're charged uh, the lowest rate on your bill. So here, in, I know most of the people on the line are probably from California, and we're all familiar with NEM 2.0 here in California. So storage is taken on, um, uh, has become increasingly favorable because of NEM 2.0. You have to, now if uh, you get solar, PV, uh, and for, pardon me if this is remedial for a lot of you, but you have, to, you will be forced to switch to a, a rate-based schedule. Uh, that is if you are in one of the investor-owned utilities. So what you can do to offset that is you can get uh, use your PV and your, your battery bank to discharge during the times when your bill is most expensive. So you can offset your bill that's making it lower. So an example of this would be if it's a, if it's a hot summer's day and you got your AC on full blast, you can drop your batteries during peak hours and to, again, offset the most important, uh, the most expensive part of your bill. And we call that rate arbitrage or time of use optimization. You might see those two terms used interchangeably. And then you got peak shaving, which uh, there's a kind of a cool graphic of kind of what that is. And if you want to see that in a different format. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, so this is really, again, in California, and not only in California, but especially here in California, um, commercial entities uh, in CNI space are charged uh, demand rates. Um, and so uh, what that means is that the uh, they're charged based on how much instantaneous power they're demanding at any given point in the day. And, that, and it's measured in, in kilowatts. So think of a, a good way to think about it as a factory that's running at full capacity at, at noon. So we'll say that the peak of this graph represents noon. So storage allows you to draw off your batteries in order to reduce the demand charges. So instead of paying a rate at that blue peak that you see uh, the apex there, uh, you, you can instead pay a rate at the red line. Again, thusly reducing your bills. So um, here is uh, here is um, a representation of our product line. It's not our entire product line. You can go to simplifypower.com to see uh, the uh, the entire product line. Um, so what you're seeing here is our mobile mobile plug and play line uh, to our uh, fully integrated solutions um, to kind of our um, core products. Which um, if you look at the the battery in the very top with a red and black terminal, I call that our, our standard battery. That's our 5 3.4 battery. Um, I know many of you are familiar with that battery. Uh, right below that um, is our uh, 5 2.6, and right below that is our low-profile battery, 
which is, uh, can be put under floorboards and tight spaces. Um, and that's also a 2.6 kilowatt hour battery. Um, uh, the bottom left um, is kind of an interesting uh, piece of equipment there. Um, it is our power bank. And it's used a lot in emergency response scenarios. It's been used in schools, in homes, and in hospitals. Um, it's kind of like a mobile um, turnkey solution. And the access as well, again, we'll get into that, is also a turnkey solution. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So uh, here you see our, our, our kind of our core products um, on the left there, uh, the Phi 3.4 uh, and the Phi 2.6, which um, you know, given that we're talking to wholesale solar and, and their customer, these, these are the batteries that you will be most interested in, I presume. So what you're looking at in this video is uh, a, lead, a lead acid replacement. And this is kind of our bread and butter. Uh, this uh, kind of differentiates us from other lithium ion manufacturers. Uh, uh, you, can just, you can keep your existing equipment and install our, our batteries, do a small reprogramming of existing inverters and charge controllers, and you get a 10-year warranty, uh, 10,000 cycle warranty, uh, as a replacement for your lead acid batteries that will most likely last no longer than five years. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's a lot, uh, there's, there's no maintenance involved. Uh, the batteries on the left, the lead acids, uh, are, are, it's a mess. Um, it have to be water replacement uh, and, valve regulation and things like that. So um, it's, a lot, it's a lot simpler, it's a lot neater, um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. So here's some basic parameters of those two core, core products um, that you can see here. We'll just let you glance at that for a moment. And on the batteries themselves is our battery management system, or BMS. So it's, the BMS is a passive system that basically just keeps the cells happy. Um, it's passive in the sense that it doesn't re require any extraneous um, electronics or uh, internet or any, anything else for it to work. It works autonomously. Um, and it can protect against those things you see listed there. And it also has a circuit breaker for over current protection. And as you can see, it's an 80 amp breaker on the 5.3.4, um, and it effectively works as an on-off switch, um, which is, and it's turned off during shipping, and it's turned off during installation. Um, the breaker works in conjunction with the built-in DMS and creates additional safety, efficiency, and functionality to the overall, overall power storage system. So um, you'll hear a lot of, if, you, if you've ever talked to, um, any of us here at, at Simplify, uh, we all know this diagram and why it's important. So our, this is something that, you know, maybe requires a little getting used to, it certainly was for me, is that our batteries are always wired in parallel. So it's not parallel in the sense that you're going negative to negative to negative or positive to positive to positive parallel wiring. It's, uh, it's, it's the one, it's the type of parallel wiring that's shown. Uh, note how all the leads head straight up to the positive and negative bus. And all those conductors that you see there must be of identical length and gauge. So um, here's one of our, our favorite pictures. I, I know it's one of mine. Um, so what you're looking at is the initial installation in 2013 on the left. And then on the right, you can see um, just two years later, they doubled the size of the bank. Um, they increase the capacity twofold. Um, and one important note that you should see here is note, note the orientation of the batteries in the right-hand side photo on top uh, that are uh, upside down. That will not void the warranty. It's just another example of how easy it is to install um, our batteries. You, you, you're not, there's less restrictions. Additionally, um, you can't see it in this photo, but they can be, they could be butted up against one another. Uh, these are using our wall mounts, uh, which we also sell separately. They could be uh, laid on their side. That's perfectly fine. Um, so any way that's practical to install these batteries, and even in low ventilation spaces, um, is totally fine. 
and this kind of, and to add one more point, uh, doing this, this type of increase in capacity with lead acid, for example, um, is a lot more complicated. When you're adding to series battery strings, um, the aging unit will limit the vi viability of the new batteries. So we're going to get into the access unit now, um, which is kind of our uh, uh, plug and play turnkey solution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it still uses the same uh, great batteries, those uh, those five three point fours. Uh, they you can they come in two varieties. You can either get two of those those uh, batteries, or you can get three of them installed in the compartment um, that's pictured in green on the access unit. And if, you've, uh, if you were to open up that cabinet, you would see that the batteries are installed side by side, right next to each other. And you don't have to worry about any heat or off-gassing or odors or anything like that. So the problems with conventional energy storage systems, um, you can kind of see right here, you kind of got to get all these pieces piecemeal. You got to get them one by one. Um, and you got to have a lot of know-how on how to configure everything. And to reiterate, you know, there's a longer design time. Often they're indoor rated only like Sonin. I'm picking on them a little bit. Um, there's, uh, you have to have uh, the multi-day installation. And if you're not trained, and you haven't done several of these before, multiple items and a special training. But with the access, we actually program it um, and install all the components here in our factory. So you could just plug and play. Um, there is uh, currently a, uh, a Schneider 6840 in, inside the unit. Um, you can DC or AC couple. It's NEMA 3R rated for outdoors. Uh, no maintenance and super safe for those lithium ion, uh, those um, LFP batteries, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Okay, so uh, what you're seeing inside the box here um, is are some of the core components that you can get inside the actual access box. So certainly you're going to get that connects inverter and charger. You're going to get those batteries. And if you're DC coupling the system, which is what's pictured right here, you can get a charge controller. Uh, that MPPT unit is a charge controller. And at the top of the box, you can see the automatic, the optional automatic generator start and the comm box. So here is a typical example of um, DC coupling. Uh, you, the, the modules head to the uh, MPPT unit uh, and the inverter and work to charge the batteries. Now that, that's, uh, is different from an AC coupled array where it goes into a sub panel or a critical loads panel and then can be used to charge the bank. So you can come in multiple directions. Um, now for now some of you guys might be thinking about California Rule 21 compliance. Uh, the Schneider is not yet Rule 21 compliant, but within the next couple months we will have this outfitted also uh, with an Outback um, 8048. Uh, radiant inverter. So that inverter is Rule 21 compliant. So if you're in one of those investor-owned utilities, uh, you can look at that as an option for you. Um, one interesting thing that I should add about this, that another differentiator, um, is that you can actually AC and DC couple at the same time. Now just keep in mind there's a 6,000 watt or so inverter inside, uh, so you want to size accordingly. Uh, but there's no reason why if you size appropriately that you can TC couple and AC couple at the same time. Okay, so common question that comes up is what kind of warranty offer do we offer? And we uh, do believe it's our, in an industry leading warranty. Um, it is, uh, comes, it's a 10 year warranty um, and it's for 10,000 cycles. If you go to 80% depth of discharge, which we recommend, or a 10-year, 5,000-cycle warranty. Um, now, whichever the, so the important distinction should be made is, is, is whichever of those comes first. Is 
when the warranty will end. So if you hit 10,000 cycles before 10 years, the warranty would end at that point. Now, this is, uh, again, best in business. Um, if you if you are uh, in, one, in the middle of the, sc the screen, we do see the, our 80% end of life. So what we're saying there is that uh, at the end of the 10 years, where you're expecting to get 80% of the initial capacity um, at, at the end of 10 years. Now, most of our competitors won't put that on because it's kind of a bummer. It's kind of a thing that they don't want to talk about. But 70%, just so you know, is, is what most of our, our competitors are doing. So at the end of, at the end of uh, uh, 10 years, we're saying that you're going to get uh, 80% of the 3.4 kilowatt hours that you initially got. And that's roughly about 2.72 kilowatt hours. All right, so we're going to learn a little bit about uh, lead acid to start and show a little bit of a lead acid comparison. So lead acid comes in a lot of different styles depending on the application. Um, some aren't heat tolerant, some are better at deep cycles, some are sealed to prevent gassing, some are cheaper than others. They all, however, are high maintenance and short-lived and usually less than five years of life um, on a lead acid battery. And uh, they're all low on capacity when compared to our lithium uh, iron phosphate battery. Now, likewise, uh, there are also different types of lithium ion batteries. Uh, some may be better than others based on the application. And then there's other ways to store energy, too. Uh, you can store fuel cells or with uh, capacitors, flywheels, hydro recapture, et cetera. So there's a number of ways to, uh, to hold uh, or to store energy. So our focus for this next session will be on the lithium family, as you might have guessed. So when, when talking about lithium ion, um, Two of the things we, we like to talk about are form factor and chemistry, and we're going to get into why that's important. So um, here, these aren't the only types of form factors, mind you. There's, there's other kinds like button cells and things like that, but these are the most common kinds in, in, in our applications. Um, and so the three kinds, as you can see, cylindrical, pouch, and prismatic. And here are the most common types of lithium. And you may be noticing some already some commonality between those chemistries and some of the uh, elements that make it up. And those are, and here we have it highlighted for you. Um, a common element amongst um, in the in the lithium family is cobalt. Um, so once again, here's another differentiator. We don't have cobalt in our batteries, and so we use the lithium iron phosphate as shown in green. So what are the problems with cobalt? Um, many of our competitors use them. Um, LG Chem and Tesla, Powerwall to name a few. Um, the, the, main, the problem is, is the, maybe the most important thing is safety, and that has, so thermal runaway is a safety issue. And we'll talk about thermal runaway in, in, the, in the next slide. Um, but another problem is, is rapid depletion. Um, at, at about 500 cycles, you're going to see rapid depletion of those cells. Um, super narrow temperature window. They're toxic and they're inefficient. So, so I simplify, we address those four major issues. Uh, safety, life cycle, temperature, and environmental impact. And so let's get into that. Okay, so when you hear in the news um, about Samsung Galaxy Notes, uh, hoverboard, hoverboard that uh, kids got for Christmas, Teslas or Boeing Dreamliners catching on fire. That's the result of a very tough volatile element, and that, and that element is cobalt. Um, cobalt is, uh, base batteries are prone to thermal runaway, which is essentially a positive feedback loop with an exponential and uncontrolled heat rise in the battery. And here's an example of uh, the Boeing Dreamliner on the right uh, catching on fire. Not good when you're when you're up there in the air with and the things catch on fire. 
So 500, approximately 500 cycles for the cells prior to rapid depletion. Now we can all relate to this. So uh, actually my wife just got a new cell phone yesterday, okay? So I'm at the end of my two-year plan on my phone. Um, so I have to do more frequent recharges on my battery than my wife will. Um, this is something we can all relate to with a laptop, with a cell phone, or what have you. Um, the battery wasn't the same when it was brand new. Um, so when you're talking about narrow temperature windows, we'll just call it out right there, 23 degrees to 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, it's, it's in that you, you have less applications to work, to work in. Um, certainly um, in colder climates and in some hot desert climates too, that won't work out too well for you. Uh, certainly in Southern California, we've been experiencing hotter than 104. So uh, cobalt is less temperature tolerant. So here you see examples of using coolant um, and heat sinks to uh, some extra ancillary stuff or equipment that uh, you don't have to use with our chemistry. So let's take a look at that 23 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit in the next line and compare it to what we can offer. So we're, our operating temperature is at negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, no need for coolant or special HVAC equipment or ventilation. Now this should be distinguished from the charging temperature. Um, you don't want to charge the batteries below freezing or above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so the question, the next question I can imagine coming up on the screen is, uh, well, what do I do if, it's, if I'm in a cold climate and it drops below freezing? So some of our installers use heating elements um, to, to warm the batteries. You can attach a temperature sensor to it a battery temperature sensor, or you can install it if, if you have a battery bank room um, and use some heating in that room as well. Um, so there's a couple ways around it. So uh, a huge problem with cobalt is that it goes straight to landfills, um, and it's been uh, linked by the EPA to a lot of health problems, respiratory problems, cardiac effects congestion of the liver and kidneys. It's, just, it's a toxic element. So our LFP uh, chemistry can be recycled. Uh, there are third-party recycling companies that do recycle our batteries. Um, our batteries are 98% efficient. Now, Tesla states on, on their uh, website that their cobalt batteries are 90% uh, efficient. So there you see the difference. So getting into the form factors now, uh, we can talk about some of the pros and cons of each form factor. Every, every single form factor does have its pros and cons. So uh, we can just kind of uh, discern which one might be the best. Okay, so we're gonna talk about pouches first. Uh, they're super lightweight and flexible. They can be stuffed into a box uh, or an enclosure is probably the better term for it, uh, much easier. Um, but the cons is that they, they're super temperature sensitive and they can swell when, those, that when, they, get a, when you, they see a heat rise and in worst case scenarios even burst. And those cells have less capacity. So uh, the, the prismatic cells um, are often called a happy medium. Um, maybe that's true, maybe it isn't, uh, but we'll let you decide. So uh, they're thin and flat, they have great space utilization. So you can imagine uh, you can fill a box with those prismatic cells pretty easily uh, without any air pockets. Uh, they do have a, a shorter life cycle. Um, inside, if you were to open up one of those, it's, it's uh, so a lot of thin separators in there, like these thin paper-like separators with a little bit of electrolyte, um, and they're prone to crystallization to some extent, um, and they're not, they, there's poor thermal management. So we uh, use the, the, cylind the cylindrical form factor. Um, 
very stable, difficult to short out, um, and uh, uh, they're a they're ma since they are circular. We know that uh, the the circle is the uh, the toughest of all the shapes, so they they have mechanical stability and they're uh, difficult to break. Um, and they, like I said, they're difficult to short, um, and they're uh, great at cyclability. The problem with the uh, cylindrical form factor is that they're heavier, um, and they create space cavities when inside the, inside the enclosure. And a good way to think about that is a box of soda filled with soda cans. You're going to have some air pockets in that box. So they are, here's what our competitors are doing. So LG Chem is using the pouch. Tesla uses a cylindrical form factor. However, they use a cobalt uh, cell. Um, the problem with the small, and it's a smaller cell than the kinds we use. And here you can see the cells uh, pictured um, the problem with smaller cells is that there's more opportunity for failure, lots of points of failure, um, and additional heat discharge as electrons pass through. So these batteries are designed for consumer electronics and really putting them in uh, solar applications uh, and cars, uh, probably, probably not the best idea. Um, these are, by the way, um, Samsung cells. Um, but um, by taking smaller cells and scaling them into residential, commercial, and utility settings, Tesla is scaling hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cells, with toxic thermal runaway risks, thereby scaling up the associated risks and hazards of lithium cobalt chemistries. So as stated previously, we're using the uh, cylindrical cells. Uh, they are larger than Tesla's um, and not designed for consumer electronics. We have less cells in our batteries, and our LFP chemistry isn't prone uh, to thermal runaway. So we're just, you know, simply stated, it's a safer battery. So um, speaking of safety, we're going to talk about shipping. And you'll be happy to know that we are approved to, uh, for all modes of transportation globally, including uh, air. Uh, when you do ship, it is required, however, that you use shipping labels. Uh, special shipping labels like the ones you see here, um, and a hazmat certification is required. See, because the Department of, of Transportation doesn't distinguish between the different types of lithium ion. So they they don't they don't care, or maybe they don't even want to care uh, that we're an LFP chemistry and not um, a cobalt based chemistry. So we're seeing a little bit of a change in that, and in, in the hearts and minds of, of uh, for example, in some of the fire codes. Uh, are, are loosening. Uh, I know in New York City, for example, where they used to not allow um, lithium ions, they're starting to allow them in. So, um, and it's based on, on on chemistry, and we have a few deployments going into the city. So, when talking about um, when when you're uh, talking about sales, you really want to talk about the true cost of of the system. So what is the true cost of the system? What, or put it simply, uh, what's the cost of every kilowatt hour I can get out of the system? So an easy thing for anyone to understand is upfront cost. You know, that battery costs X amount and that battery costs Y amount. But that's not the true cost of a battery. So a uh, spoiler alert, we're not, as, we're not as cheap as lead acid batteries. Um, so how do you convey that to a customer when they're, they're uh, trying to, when they're shopping around. So here's a simple formula. So the price, that upfront cost, goes as your numerator. Uh, now we're, and then in your denominator, you have to do some, uh, you have to multiply a few things together. So capacity, certainly we have much better capacity than a lead acid battery. Multiply that by the number of cycles. Again, much better than a lead acid battery. Uh, multiply that by uh, some other D rates. Uh, a common one is temperature. So again, cobalt-based chemistries, lead acid, are, are, are much less tolerant to temperature. Um, so how much are you going to have to derate for temperature? Uh, times the depth of discharge. Uh, we, we recommend 
going to uh, 80% depth of discharge, uh, some or less. So the, the, the lower the depth of discharge, the bigger, the more batteries you're going to have to buy, the more capacity you're going to need. So these are important things to consider. They're not the only thing to consider. Uh, you want to consider the ancillary costs. So what are some of the ancillary costs or hidden costs? You know, do I need to designate a special room in my house for all these batteries? Um, so there's a square footage and installation location uh, consideration. Uh, the weight of the batteries. Um, that's going to increase your shipping costs. Do I need special equipment? Do I need to do any cooling or um, do I, uh, any special ancillary equipment for cooling? So as you can see here, I'm not going to read through the whole list, uh, but there's often these hidden costs uh, that are associated um, with uh, with other systems. Okay, so here you can see uh, a graph that was brought to us by Lazard um, where it shows uh, cost savings, the actual cost, the levelized cost of energy of lead acid versus lithium ion. So residential, so here we have residential and the C and C and I. So you're at least going to uh, save $135 per megawatt hour with, uh, in residential and at least $118 in the CNI space per megawatt hour. Um, so, and that's, the, that's, that's saying doing it conservatively. Um, you can see how much you could potentially save um, by the graph here. Not to mention all the headaches of uh, having to uh, have your lead acid batteries replaced um, and, and equalized and all that, all the other, all the other headaches that go along with it. So we're going to talk a, a little more about lead acid and just show some graphs. Um, so here you can see our available capacity versus current. So you're going to see some rates of discharge at the bottom. Uh, it's okay if you don't understand what those mean right off the bat. We're actually going to get into that in a, a little bit. Um, generally speaking, you don't want to exceed a C over 2 rate. Uh, but even, um, even if you did, the available capacity of our batteries is, is pretty uniform across um, all uh, discharge rates. Okay, so here you're going to see why we warranty for 10,000 cycles. There's no significant loss of cycle life across a, a really broad temperature range. Cycle life is, is pretty much steady at 10,000. Okay, so the, the batteries um, from this graph, um, they don't struggle to charge and discharge. You can do so across a wide temperature range. Um, some people say that our, our batteries are quick charge batteries um, because you can trend they, because they can charge in, in approximately two hours. So, um, not to belabor the point, but here's some of the key takeaways. Uh, five versus lead acid. No memory effect, no maintenance, simple integration, no ventilation, consistent performance, and a better levelized cost of energy. So system sizing. Here we'll learn a little bit about those C rates and a few other things. So uh, real simple calculation. Um, somebody says, uh, I have 36, I need 36 kilowatt hours worth of storage. Uh, here's an example of how you can calculate it. Um, but in the next slide, we'll show you that how, why that's typically not the way you do it. Uh, this is a simplistic way of doing it. Um, the better way to do it is by pointing out that you know, we really only want to take these down to 80% depth of discharge uh, to abide by that 10,000 cycle warranty um, and 10 year, 10,000 cycle warranty. So here's the actual calculation. You actually want to divide by 2.72, which is, uh, as previously stated, 80% of 3.4. So in, in essence, 11 batteries, you can, you can calculate it that way, but a better calculation would be 13 in this scenario. 
And the same holds true with amp hours. Sometimes, especially everyone who's familiar with the lead acid, from lead acid days, um, they're normally designated by amp hourage. So, um, so you can do that same calculation. And additionally, you can take 80% of the 67, so 67 amp hours for 148 volt battery. Um, for those keeping score at home, 80% of 67 is 53.6. So you can you can divide by uh, so 700 divided by 53.6, and that would tell you how many batteries you should use. So that's a, those are some simple calculations you can do with the calculator. We also have some more advanced tools um, that show some of the same things we're we're talking about. It does the same simple calculation, and it shows a few other things. And uh, we have some in, uh, enhanced calculators um, where you can even do a bit of array sizing and and sizing for off-grid and um, put in a few D rate factors. So, um, yeah, so there, this suffice to say that we have some enhanced tools uh, should you need them. And, of course, we can share those with wholesale solar. All right, so um, we've, seen, we've seen this graphic before um, earlier in the presentation. Uh, same voltage. As these, are, these are in parallel. Um, these batteries. So it's the same voltage across the whole entire bank, uh, but the current adds and the amp hour capacity adds as you add batteries, but not the voltage. There it is again. You'll hear that a lot of times. So C over two. Uh, it's actually a real simple calculation. So we're looking, so the C is your numerator and that is the capacity of the battery in amp hours and two is the time in hours. So the calculation is this. 67 amp hours is one by 3.4 battery at 48 volts. Uh, divide by two, you get 33 and a half amps. So what we're saying is that the max charge rate and the max discharge rate that you want to use is 33 and a half amps for that particular battery. So the goal is to try to target that uh, when you're sizing a bank uh, for to get the most longevity out of the batteries. Uh, if you absolutely had to do it, the max discharge current is 60 amps for that 48 volt 53.4. Okay, so this is another differentiator. Um, if you were to compare this, this graph to a, uh, a lead acid graph, um, it would look a lot different. It would look a lot more choppy. Um, so this, this discharge curve illustrates the full available operating range for a 48 volt 5 battery. Uh, note the smooth and, and continuous discharge curve. The curve at the left peaks up at, a, at approximately 58 volts and sweeps down and uh, till its complete duration, which is actually 36 volts. Um, but the actual useful portion of, of the battery um, is between 57.6 and 40 volts. Usually at uh, uh, 40 volts, we'll do a uh, low battery, battery voltage cutoff. So again, this, so it differentiating us from um, uh, other uh, chemistries. Most applications, especially off-grid, will engage a generator well before 40 volts, perhaps even 46 volts, or begin load shedding to avoid a system shutdown. So um, here is an example of our, uh, a way of tracking state of charge. Um, certainly not the only or even the best way to do it, but it gives you an idea of uh, some of the voltage ranges um, at varying state of charges. So if you, if you pay attention to the right-hand column only for 48 volts uh, to make it easier, um, you notice that 36 volts uh, is 0%. So that's when the battery is, is done. Um, and it needs, uh, it will certainly need to recharge at that point. But, um, but uh, again, this would look a lot more choppy if it were a lead acid battery. And the voltage means it's pretty stiff. It remains pretty fixed, um, as you can see. 
just going to check some chats real quick just to make sure. We're good. Okay. I'm always paranoid that people might not be able to hear me. So, anyways, moving along. So, uh, we offer um, integration guides uh, for the power electronics. We work really closely uh, with uh, Schneider. Uh, this is an example of a Schneider 6848 uh, Outback, Midnight, um, and some of the other major manufacturers out there. And we have integration guides set up. Um, uh, that will help you install the system. And here's an example of, of one. This is a, it's actually a snippet of one from our Schneider guide. And so some basic installation stuff uh, without going into really intensive detail. Um, here is an example of a real neat uh, installation. You can see um, the leads of the batteries file neatly into a cable tray there, um, and then combine in that combiner box into, and then go into the Sunny Boy inverters. So uh, one thing that you may want to keep in mind here is that the, some of these cables, so they're all supposed to be of identical length and gauge, as we mentioned. So that means the, the batteries closest to that combiner box um, are going to have the most slack in it. So typically what you can do, um, I mean, if you're not using a cable tray or, or something like this, and even if you are, you can zip tie them, um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but again, just as long as the idea is to keep all the, the conductors of uh, equal length. So we mentioned no ventilation requirements. So, that's a, that, so what you're seeing there is an attic stuffed with batteries. Um, and they're jam-packed together. Um, and you're, they're, in this case, they're using our wall mounts. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, they can be installed in any orientation. So it is possible uh, to use bus bars. Um, as you can see in this photograph here, the batteries are, are lying on their side. Um, and, um, the, and as long so you just want to be, if you're going to do this type of installation, you want to make sure you size those bus bars correctly. Um, their opacities are based on uh, their dimensions or their cross sections. So um, it's important to check your guide um, or speak with someone uh, to make sure that you're sizing those correctly and make sure there's no uh, impedance or resistance in the batteries. Um, should they be sized correctly, you won't have that problem. So once again, they do not emit, um, the batteries don't create gases or vapors. And I touched on this a moment ago, but the cable, the cabling um, is wrapped in cable tied uh, here uh, using zip ties. It's hard to, to see in the photo, but uh, trust me, they're there. And here's an example of uh, some of a bank of batteries with Outback Radiant inverters. And you can see some stacking going on here. You can see uh, two inverters and two charge controllers. And uh, multiple batteries. Um, so we're just about coming to the end here. Um, uh, I'll keep this up on the uh, screen, so uh, different ways to get in touch. Um, Wholesale Solar, uh, one thing that's awesome about them is that they're super technically savvy and market savvy, and uh, they can they have a tech team that uh, can help you with your questions. Um, so there is their uh, contact info, and if you're not a dealer yet, uh, definitely sign up um, uh, via that link. Um, so that just about does it. Um, if you guys have uh, any questions, uh, well, I guess, uh, well, let me, let me push, push it to Josh real quick if you want to come on the line. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? And Lisa, too. All right. Well, let me check the chat here. So there's a lot of questions that came in. So 
Josh, I'm just going to check real quick to see if you're muted. I think you may have wanted to say something there. Hey, Josh, you're off mute right now. So is there, uh, I'm not sure why that keeps happening. Is there anything you wanted to chime in with? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, we can we can supply the access systems, which are plug and play all in one or or mainly what we're selling is the actual individual batteries. And then we can help design that into a system with Outback, Schneider, Magnum, Midnight, any of the major brands. Um, Ricky, it looks like there's a couple of questions, one from Alden and one from Andrew Perkins in the chat um, that I'm, I'm hoping you can answer. I wasn't sure about the answer on those two. Um, what are their names? I'll try to find them. Or do you know the question offhand? The one thing that's difficult with this format. So, Josh, sorry, I don't know why I keep putting you on mute there. Uh, but um, Oh, no worries. Uh, Andrew Perkins was asking, how do you restart the batteries when they shut down from low depth of discharge? Um, there's... Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a couple ways of doing it. Um, if you, uh, you, you probably want to make sure that um, the battery is cycled off at that point. Um, and there are some, uh, if, if it's completely, if the battery is, is, is not taking a charge, um, you might want to look into uh, some, some external chargers for it. Um, but uh, typically, you can you, you want to do some uh, voltage testing. Um, make sure that the, the battery, the, the voltage is is kind of meeting up to our specs, um, and charge the battery that way. Ricky, is the is the recording going to be available? Uh, we are recording it. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we can send that out to everyone who uh, who registered. Sounds great. Was there a second question there? Alden was asking uh, about charger set points for the solar charge controllers. Um, do you do you know like the uh, float and absorb set points offhand? Uh, off, offhand, no. I mean, they're all they're all in our integration guide. Uh, for the float and and uh, and the bulk, so they're they're you know you're approximately because um, the voltage remains steady, um, but the the generally somewhere between fifty six and fifty seven volts for float and uh, or I'm sorry, excuse me, well for float we don't float. There's no float on our our batteries, but bulk and absorb. Um, it's not like a, a lead lead acid where you have to do float charges. Um, but the bulk and absorb are, are roughly around 56 to 57 volts. Okay, what is the self-discharge? How long can they be stored and how do you store them long term? Um, yeah, so it's less than 1% a month. So they can be stored, you know, for you know, a few months uh, without any problems charging them up. Okay, great. And uh, Brian Summers is asking about monitoring data collection. Um, a lot of the inverters are going to have, you know, monitoring and data logging capabilities. Same with charge controllers. Are are you relying on the inverters and controllers to do that work, or is there anything in Simplify that can be accessed? Yeah, the great question. So we don't have any comms on on our batteries. We just have the you know positive negative terminal and a BMS. So. Again, it's just the simplified way of doing it, um, pun intended. Um, so we don't, um, so the comms we do have rely on third parties uh, for comms. We're looking to integrate more um, uh, comms into our, into our, our uh, systems. Uh, but at this point, it's actually been, we found it's been kind of a benefit not to have uh, 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 all these kind of difficult to install um, Internet-based comms um, that some of the other other uh, our, um, competitors use. Um, so yes, the short answer to your question is that um, state of charge, uh, other metrics like that have to be done via third-party equipment. Okay, that sounds good. 
Well, it looks like that's most of the questions. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for, for attending. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so thanks again for attending. Um, I still see on your screen um, the uh, ways to contact Wholesale Solar. Um, and, yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, shoot them an email or a call, and uh, we're happy to help as well. All right, so that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ricky. So the one guy was here on the mic and Maria. Got some good things privately.